USMLE has existed for quite some time as your way and your ticket really to working as a doctor in the United States. Now, recently, as we've been discussing on our channel, and those of you who are in the know, PLAB is turning into UKMLA. So now, of course, the question is there. What's the difference between UKMLA and USMLE? I mean, the names are so similar, obviously, then the exams must be similar as well. So that's why we thought it's really important for us to look at the two exams, understand their differences, and what it means for you as the international medical graduate. <laughs> If this is the first time you're checking out our channel, welcome. Basically what we do is we run a website that's totally free known as roadtouk.com and it will explain the ins and outs about everything related to the United Kingdom and what it takes for you to work as a doctor in the NHS. So if you've not already, please stalk us on all of our social media. Find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. Hey guys, Ibreeze here, and before I get started, have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Because if you haven't, the button's right there. Click that button, and let's look at this now. With USMLE, as you all have already understood and known up until now, since it's been there for like, pretty much our entire lives, um, it's a licensing exam, all right? That means with this exam, you are obtaining the license to practice in the United States. The UKMLA is also a licensing exam. Okay, so by passing the UKMLA, you're processing your registration so that you can work as a doctor in the United Kingdom. That's the first thing basically you have to understand. USMLE is for the US, UKMLA is for the UK. It's really nice now because they've at least put it in their names, USMLE and UKMLA. All right, two big things, really easy takeaways. They're licensing exams. Remember I said they're licensing exams. They are not postgraduate qualifications. Not even USMLE. I know somebody's already getting ready to type and say, wait, 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 wait. No, the USMLE is not a postgraduate qualification. You see, in the United States, the students who are taking it are medical students. You can take USMLE as a medical student. Same thing with UKMLA. For the UK medical students, they will be taking this exam. So these are not postgraduate qualifications. If you're wondering what is an example of a postgraduate qualification, so if we see in the context of the United Kingdom, it would be a royal college exam like the MRCP or the MRCS. Those are postgraduate qualifications. Oftentimes they have other stipulations and requirements. Like for instance, for MRCP, you need to have at least one year of post-grad experience. Like you have to have graduated, done some internship, and then you can take the exam. Some of the other exams like MRCOG, you actually have to be like in a structured training postgraduate program. So that's the other thing to take away. They are not postgraduate qualifications. They are simply licensing exams. Now, of course, the next natural question. All right, so you said that they're different exams or they're not really postgraduate exams, but does that mean that's our only option? Well, for the United States, if you wanna work as a doctor in the United States, the USMLE is the only way that you can then obtain ECFMG verification to then practice and work. Of course, there are other processes that come into that. Just having the verification doesn't mean suddenly you can work, but we're not gonna get into that. But just in terms of actually holding that type of registration and verification so that you would be considered a legally licensed doctor in the United States, you must take USMLE. That is not the case for UKMLA or basically for the United Kingdom, because UKMLA is just one of the exams you can take. We have numerous videos talking about the different ways you can obtain registration in the United Kingdom to practice as a doctor, but just for a quick idea, UKMLA, Royal College exams, the medical training initiative, sponsorship, there are a lot of different schemes and ways out there. So UKMLA is not the end all be all. If you're aiming for the postgraduate route by doing a Royal College or an MTI, you don't have to think about UKMLA. Now who has to take these exams? So for USMLE, doesn't matter if you're an American medical graduate or you're graduating from the United States, or if you're an international medical graduate, if you wanna practice in the US, guess what you gotta do? You've gotta take the USMLE. Okay, so it's for both individuals, both local U.S. graduates as well as international graduates. Doesn't matter what your nationality is either. If you're an American who's graduated abroad, you would still need USMLE just like everyone else. Now for the UK MLA, unlike PLAB, the new thing about the UK MLA is that UK graduates will also have to take it. So you've got UK graduates who are going to be taking it as, you know, the medical students, they will take it 
they'll be done. And of course, international medical graduates. Now, those of you who have been following our channel well already will know that EU EEA graduates are currently exempt from UKMLA. We have a video where we talk about that that I would suggest you check out because I don't want to spend too much time on that here. But right now, your thing to understand is, of course, that if you're an international medical graduate or a UK medical student, in the next year or so, what you will be facing is the UK MLA. And it does not matter what your nationality is, it just kind of matters actually where you're graduating from. All right, now naturally you guys are gonna ask about the exam, about exam prep, like what are we supposed to do? So the USMLE, cause like I said, they've been changing things, have step one, step two, and step three. Okay, there used to be that differentiation in step two where they had a clinical skills and a clinical knowledge part. They took that away. And now alongside taking these exams, there are six pathways within which you can figure out what your pathway is, like what's most applicable to you in your particular predicament. And then you complete that and you go about your way. And as you know, it's a computerized exam. So UKMLA has two parts. It's called AKT and the CPSA. If you want to know more about those parts, check out our video talking about it. But basically, it's also a computerized exam. So it's nice. Two computerized exams hopefully means more availability. Fingers crossed. That's what we're looking at for the future. Now, how do you prepare? For you assembly, because I don't want to get too much into it. There's a lot of little things, guys. Stuff like first aid, stuff like UWorld and BMEs, all that good stuff. But really, if you're here, you're thinking about the UKMLA, aren't you? And if you're thinking about the UKMLA, even though I've already mentioned one video before, really look at the new content map. It's a completely new system. You're gonna ask me, but a breeze, is it gonna be like USMLE? Well, there's a lot of basic anatomy, biochemistry, and honestly, who remembers the Krebs cycle and the coagulation cascade? Like, why are they even important? I feel you. If you look at the content map, you'll understand it's not that dire for the MLA content map. It's just more along the lines of actually physically understanding some of the pathophysiology a little bit more and then kind of, you know, the treatment plans and presentations. So I think it's an actually an okay way, which is why when we developed our QBank, we took all of that into consideration and made it in a way that you can understand what you need to know from when you need to know it. You might ask me, all right, if I'm still a medical student, is there any use in getting the QBank right now? Honestly, it's more along the lines of you concentrating really well on medical school, getting closer to the end of the line, and then looking at how you can integrate the QBank into your medical learning. Because I would say it's a supplement, but I wouldn't say just use that to get through med school either uh, entirely. Especially because you know, just the way with, with PLAB, you're going to have to do your IELTS or OET first, your English language proficiency. So that actually should be your first priority because without that, you're not going to be able to book the UKMLA. Now, I know you're going to ask me, all right, fine, Breeze, you said all of this. How much is this going to set me back? What are the costs? How much money is all of this going to be? We'll link in the description box from what the USMLE current cost standard is because honestly, with all these things, they do just keep changing it. But suffice to say, it's not going to be any too different for the UKMLA as far as we can understand. It looks like they're gonna keep the same general pricing structure as they have for PLAB. Now the UK grads, the kids who are taking it from the UK medical schools will not be paying for it. So it's just gonna be the international doctors who are gonna be paying for it. So it looks like it'll probably be how much they're setting it up for PLAB. And as you know, every year around April-ish, they increase the cost of PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 by like a pound. So that's probably gonna continue as well. I mean, it makes the most sense. Keeping that in mind, since PLAB has historically always been much cheaper than the USMLE, if the UKMLA keeps on that trend of where they stay about where they charge for PLAB, I would say the same would still be there. The USMLE overall is a much more expensive exam than the entire MLA pathway in terms of even for registration, English proficiency, EPIC, all of that kind of stuff. So I don't anticipate that changing. But the minute that information comes out, of course, you know, we'll be there and we'll be comparing it. Last point I'm going to mention. So as I said before, you complete US USMLE, you get your verification. You have to apply for the match. The match being the way then you then figure out if you can get into a residency program or not. You can look on basically the USMLE website or the match kind of website to see what are the statistics, what are the chances. But as I've said in previous videos, you know that the US has this thing where they have malignant programs or IMG friendly programs. Some places will sponsor visas, some places won't sponsor visas. It might be a bit of a gamble, especially if you have, you know, what they call a long year of graduation. Like it's been a while since you've graduated. If you don't have U.S. clinical experience, if you don't have letters of rec, 
if you don't have a lot of research or publications, depending on what kind of specialty you're applying to. So you've got to come really prepared. The big concern people typically have with UKMLA is you can't directly apply to a training program. But we know that's not true because we've watched the other videos where we've talked about this. So with UKMLA, you have two options, basically. You, depending on how you have obtained your registration, whether it's provisional or full, may apply to do internship in the UK under the UK Foundation program. You might, if you have full registration, apply for an FY2 standalone program. You might apply directly into a training program if you meet the qualifications like GP training or internal medicine training or core surgical training. Or you may opt for a non-training job and then progress into training or just do what you want to do because that's just how the system is. It's a little bit more flexible. So there are always that kind, there's always that kind of concern people have in the back of their mind that, well, what about job security? What about saturation? Okay, I'm gonna say this one more time for the people in the back. All doctors right now in the United Kingdom, and this has been the case for some time now, are in something they call the shortage occupancy list. What does that mean? They're not enough doctors. That's why we're on this list. Our visa fees are less. They want us to come and work there. Check out GMC's workforce report. Every year they've come out with it for like the last two or three years have been saying the same thing. We need more doctors. We have an increased reliance on international medical graduates. Why is this? Because they don't have enough doctors. Now, remember, just like with USMLE, also with UKMLA, just because you pass the exams and you get registration does not mean you are guaranteed a job. Nothing like that is guaranteed. I don't know any job in the world that, you know, you just complete the exam or you do whatever schooling you need for it and suddenly they're like, job, without an interview or without at least some sort of a process so that they can see portfolio-wise, experience-wise or whatever, are you actually suited for the job? And that's the same case here. But we do have a video talking about saturation, some other things that I will link so that you guys can look into it further. But basically, that's our comparison of USMLE and UKMLA. Fingers crossed you've understood everything I needed to tell you. Maybe there's some things I haven't mentioned that you're still curious about. You can always comment below. But if you haven't already, as I said before, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to talk about this further, but on a more personal level, you can always book a personalized guidance session. And we will see you next time. Bye.